I'm Ray Stewart, and I'm a helicopter pilot. Now, a few months ago, I couldn't have said I was a helicopter pilot. I wasn't any kind of pilot a few months ago because I had never flown in a light plane before I started taking helicopter lessons. Now, what you're going to see is a personal narrative. Actually, I'm a television producer, but I learned to fly a helicopter to prove a point. The title of this film is Anyone Can Fly, and Mr. Guy Miller, who runs Miller Aviation Center at the Allegheny County Airport in Pittsburgh, wanted to prove the point that anyone could learn to fly a helicopter, and I was chosen as that anyone. You couldn't have found anyone with any less experience since all I had ever flown in was airline aircraft. So we made our agreement and I went out to the airport to get a little orientation. I hadn't even seen a Brantley helicopter, which is what I was supposed to learn to fly. So I was introduced to Ray Custer, who was to be my instructor, and Ray introduced me to the Brantley helicopter, and this on-the-ground introduction went like this. When you are flying a helicopter, you have both hands and both feet working. I have my right hand on the one control, my left on another control, and my feet are on the rudder pedals. Now, going down to the rudder pedals, when I uh, push the left pedal with my left foot, I turn the helicopter to the left, and vice versa with the right pedal. Now, in my right hand here, I have the cyclic control stick. Any direction that I move that stick, this is the direction the helicopter will move. By moving the stick to the left, I move it left. By moving the stick right, the helicopter moves right. Now as I move it forward, the helicopter will go forward. The further I move it, the faster the helicopter will go. Now, in my left hand, I have the collective pitch stick. On the end of this stick is the motorcycle-type throttle. By twisting that throttle, I control the power of the engine. The pitch stick moves up and down. At the same time I'm moving the pitch stick, I am turning the throttle to keep a constant revolutions per minute. Now, as I move it up, the, I increase the pitch on the main rotor blades, and this causes the helicopter to rise, to climb. And by moving it down, I decrease the pitch on the main rotor blades, and the helicopter then goes down. And this uh, covers the control system in the cockpit. Now we can go from here to the main rotor head, which is behind the pilot. Underneath this head in the fuselage is the engine, and on top of the engine is a centrifugal clutch, which in turn turns this main rotor head. Underneath that head, where the blades are attached, you can see what we call the swash plate. The blades are connected to that swash plate by links, control links. This swash plate turns, revolves, that is, with the main rotors. And through those links, it controls the pitch of the main rotor blade. Now, when I move the collective pitch stick up or down, I move that swash plate up or down, and this increases or decreases the pitch of the main rotor blades. There you can see them changing pitch. Now, when I move the cyclic control stick, I tilt that swash plate, and this causes the blades to change pitch differentially. That is, if I tilt the swash plate forward, the blades will climb to the rear of the helicopter and dive to the front, and this tilts the helicopter forward. 
Now, here you can see the main rotor blades and also the back end, the tail of the helicopter, and you can see the small tail rotor, which is an anti-torque rotor system. This tail rotor it changes pitch. The pitch is changed with those rudder pedals we saw before. When I apply left rudder, I increase the pitch on that tail rotor and the helicopter turns to the left. When I apply right rudder, I decrease the pitch on that tail rotor and the helicopter turns to the right. And there you see the tail rotor gearbox on the top of the tail rotor pylon. The tail rotor turns about three times as fast as the main rotor system. Well, for a novice like me, there was an awful lot to learn, but Ray Custer was a good instructor. We spent some time at the blackboard in ground school, I guess you would say, in learning the theory of flight of a helicopter and this nature of thing. Then I got my student pilot's certificate from the Federal Aviation Agency. I picked up my log book. I had my flight physical. And with all of this behind me, I was ready for my first flight as a student pilot. Well, this was it, time for my orientation flight. We didn't let a little drizzle dampen our spirits. Nothing like taking your first flight in the rain to prove a helicopter can be safely flown in all kinds of weather. The helicopter, its theory of flight, its mechanical, electrical, and aerodynamic structure were explained to me again. As instruction continued, we would go over these matters many times for understanding and safety. Pre-flight inspection of the aircraft is a necessary procedure before any flight. So the steps to be followed in pre-flight were carefully explained step by step. Even though someone else may have checked over the aircraft before assigning it to the pilot, I found it's the pilot's personal responsibility to give his aircraft a thorough pre-flight inspection before starting the engine. Mechanical linkage on the swash plate must be checked as one of the many items in the pre-flight checklist. You don't get in a hurry when preparing for a helicopter flight, especially not your very first flight as a student pilot. We went over the instrument panel and various controls once again. Helicopter terminology was very much the same as Chinese to me. There was the tachometer and the manifold pressure to watch, the cyclic control to master and the collective pitch to understand, not to mention torque, carburetor heat, and altimeter readings. As lessons progressed, I was to learn about ground effect, translational lift, and gyroscopic precession. Right now, the whole subject was a jumble of confusion for me. However, I nodded apparent understanding and wondered if I would ever really know what all those dials and knobs were for. It was bound to happen. We taxied away from the hangar and lifted off the ground into a hover. Ground effect, that's what does it. I didn't understand it then, but those rotors cause a downdraft of air, which creates a cushion of air, which permits the helicopter to do what you see there. Control of the helicopter in a hover and various hovering maneuvers are basic skills the student must master. As I marveled at the skill of my instructor demonstrating the ease with which a helicopter could be handled, I was convinced I could never do that. So hovering maneuvers were over and we were off. Nose down, collective up, cyclic forward, compensate with right rudder, gain forward speed into translational lift, keep a sharp lookout for other aircraft, and away we go. The helicopter is a fascinating aircraft, as you can see. There was a long way to go because it takes about 40 hours of dual and solo instruction before you're even eligible to take your flight examination. But you've seen what the helicopter does, and I'd like to give you just a quickie course in helicopter aerodynamics. And I have here a three-blade rotor similar to that used on the Brantley helicopter. There are technical names for this, which I'm not going to go into. Now, I've taken these three rotors, which would be similar, and without the body of the helicopter, just imagine that my hand is the helicopter and we're facing this way. This is forward. When we rev up our helicopter, what is causing the helicopter to move in any given direction is the plane of this rotor. In other words, you want to go forward, you move the cyclic stick 
That tilts the rotor forward and the helicopter moves forward. When you straighten up, the helicopter will hover if you're close to the ground and you want to go backward, you tilt the rotor of the helicopter and go backward. Uh, straighten up, you want to go to the side, you go this way. You want to go to the side, you go this way. In other words, what you do with the stick determines what the helicopter does. Now, the tail rotor is merely an anti-torque rotor to keep you from turning around and around with the uh, rotor that's above you. That's all that it serves. This is what does the action. Actually, you're suspended, so to speak, right from the center of that helicopter, and you have complete control of it with your cyclic. When you go forward, you go like this. When you go back, you go like this, and so forth. What you have to do in learning to be a helicopter pilot is to learn that as you pull up on the uh, collective, you're going to go up. This is going to cause other things to change. So as I sit in the chair, I have to have my feet on the rudders. I can tell you all this now but because I have a license at the time that you're seeing this film being made. I had been told this myself. and I didn't understand it exactly. But anyway, there you are. This rotor and the control that you have over it is what controls your direction and mode of flight. We had many hours of study, so let's get back and see what happened to the student pilot. Now, if you don't mind, we're going to show off a little bit. We're coming in fast on a quick stop landing. Watch the nose go up. Cyclic stick back. This is excellent control of the aircraft. Now we come down, slow down into a hover. Now watch the nose go forward. Push the cyclic stick forward. Watch the nose go forward and the aircraft pick up speed. We're in a hover now. And we're following the square pattern. This is a basic maneuver. Square it is. We've come toward the camera. We're backing up. Come to a stop on the corner. Go away from the camera. Over to the other corner. These are imaginary corners, but they're supposed to be square. Constant heading. Then forward to close the square. This is a basic maneuver in the control of the cyclic stick and other controls of the helicopter. Nose in constant position following a square pattern. Lift off, try it again. Let's back up. That was hard to do. Aircraft are not supposed to back up, helicopter does. Keep smooth, constant speed. Forward and run on landing. This is sort of running on the way an airplane lands. Now watch this. Around. Constant speed. Now, this is demonstration by the instructor. I had to learn this, but believe me, I wasn't doing it right now. 360 degrees over one spot. I had to learn that. Wasn't sure I was going to. You pull up the collective, and away you go. Up, up, up. Now, this is an excessively high hover because there was a good wind. We're way up in the air and back down. You take advantage of these things to show how you control a helicopter. Settle down, lift off into a hover. Let's go through that maneuver again, sideways now, to follow around the square pattern. Oh well, let's turn around and give you a good view of the pilots. Well, by this time, I had had my hands on the controls. I knew what they were supposed to do. I didn't have good control over those controls, but I knew how to turn the uh, aircraft by the rudders, how to make it go forward and backward by the cyclic stick and so forth. A lot of experience had to be given me in control of these. And of course, the aircraft logbook took care of uh, the number of hours that I had put in and dual instruction, and I wasn't anywhere near ready for solo at this time. But I was impressed by the Brantley helicopter. But since my life depended upon this aircraft uh, very frequently since I was taking these lessons, I wanted to know more about the helicopter. And so I went to the Brantley factory. 
In the small western town of Frederick, Oklahoma, Brantley helicopters are manufactured, flight tested, and flown away to users wherever they may be. This visit was one of personal interest. I wanted to know the aircraft I was flying. I found careful craftsmanship together with continuing research and development aimed at product improvement. From fabrication of individual parts through subassembly of individual sections to final assembly of the aircraft, I detected a pride of workmanship among the workers. But workmanship is not completed when the helicopter rolls off the assembly line. There remain several hours of flight testing and adjustment and final inspection and licensing by the Federal Aviation Agency before final delivery can be made. This is not mass production of a product, but careful construction of a carefully designed aircraft capable of many hours of safe and reliable flight. Mr. N.O. Brantley, developer of the Brantley helicopter, took his pilot training in 1925, and during World War II, he began with the aid of his two partners to design a post-war helicopter. In 1943, they built the prototype of the first Brantley B-1. And so some 15 years of engineering and development led to the Brantley B-2 helicopter and organization of the Brantley Helicopter Corporation in December 1953. I was impressed. I got some instruction by the chief test pilot out there, and some particular instruction that I got was the full touchdown landing in auto rotation. That's a new word. An auto rotation means that the engine is dead, and the movement of the air through the rotor blades is what keeps you flying, sort of like a maple leaf coming down. You've seen that happen. It's possible to land a helicopter in auto rotation just as softly as a maple leaf lands. Now, the next film you're going to see is a full touchdown auto rotation. The engine is dead, and the procedure is like this. You're coming down like this, and at a certain point, you flare the helicopter. That stops it, and then you settle it down on the ground. Keep that action in mind as you see this film. Watch this closely. This may not impress you, but the engine is dead. This is an auto-rotational landing. We're making a full landing on the ground without the engine. There was the nose up coming into the flare, and we landed on the ground. Now, it all happens fast, and it may not impress you, but believe me, it is an important safety factor in the flying of a helicopter. You can get all the way down on the ground safely in that manner. Now, we're going to... Uh, fly around a little bit, and we're coming in again. Now, watch this. We're making a run on landing. This is a high altitude landing, and this was necessary to learn in order to pass the FAA test. We run on the ground like an airplane with forward speed of something maybe 15 miles an hour, and we skid to a stop. Now, this takes careful rudder control, and under certain circumstances of high humidity and high altitude, you might have to land a helicopter that way, and that's why you have to learn it. This is a safe, aircraft to fly, but you have to learn all of the techniques and you have to pass a very rigid test in order to do that. Well, let's come up and give you a close, close look. Something's coming up now that is very important, and I tell you it's important because you, again, might not realize it, but you're about to see my first solo. Now, granted, I'm not going to take off and fly around, such as the solo might be in an airplane, but since hovering maneuvers are so important, my first solo was actually solo hovering. So the instructor is out, he ducks low to get under the rotor blades, and there I am all by myself. Let's see what happens. Up with the collective now. Compensate with the rudders. Oh, oops, well, <laughs> the nose is supposed to stay straight toward the camera and I'm supposed to be hovering right over one certain spot. Well, you can't be perfect the first time anyway. Uh, over here on the spot, that's the idea. Stay over one spot. <laughs> I couldn't hover in a 10-acre field the first time. Don't get those skids down too low. Keep them up there. Come on, turn it around. Come on, turn it around, around. That's it, keep it toward the camera. Now hold it steady. Steady as she goes, hover over one spot. Well, it takes practice. 
the fact is I got it off the ground. I did some maneuvers. They were unplanned maneuvers, but I did some maneuvers. And we get her back down on the ground in one piece. So there you go. I, my first solo hovering. I'm back on the ground. No harm done. I really wasn't too bad, was it? Well, we need a lot of practice, and you watch that thing fishtail, and you can tell who's at the controls here. Instead of a straight, steady as she goes course, watch how she swings back and forth. I had trouble with rudder controls. That's why all of this. Whoops, whoops. Let's straighten it out. Straighten it out. Now we're in a hover, and now we set it down. And there she goes. Wasn't so smooth, but you gotta practice. Now we're coming in for a quick stop over Allegheny County Airport. And now watch. If you thought the solo hovering was important, as I thought it was, watch what happens here. We have to find a little spot. I didn't know what he was looking for. I didn't know why he didn't just land or go back to the Miller hangar or, or do whatever he normally did when we came in in this manner. But he sort of hovered around and, and looked like he couldn't make up his mind just exactly what he wanted to do. He was making up his mind, all right, because the door of the helicopter opens and he gets out. I'm on my own. This is my first bona fide solo. I didn't know I was going to make it at this particular time. I found out. So you contact the tower, get clearance from the tower to take off. All this is procedure you've done with the instructor sitting beside you, but now you're on your own. So let's check out everything. Check over the controls one last time. Lift her off into a hover. Now what we're gonna do is go back to the corner there so that we can have a longer takeoff. I mean, you got to stall a little bit. You don't really expect a man on his first solo to just take right off. Here we go. Nose down. I think it's down a little too far, but we're off into the wild blue yonder, so to speak. Well, it, you're so busy taking off and you get up there and everything's all right, but take it from me. Once you get up there, you follow a pattern around and you're coming back, that's when you begin to wonder what you're doing up there in the first place. So here we are, we made the circle around the field and we're coming back in again. Slowly, this is a long approach that we're making here. And as the tops of the hangars come into view, we begin to slow down. You maintain a constant apparent ground speed. Come on now, lower the tail, slower down, slower down, slower down, come into a hover. Uh, that is not too bad, not too bad. We come into a hover and we completed our first solo. Well, my first solo experience was quite an experience, believe me, but there was much more instruction to be had, both dual and, of course, solo to learn how to handle and get confidence in this helicopter when I was up there by myself. I then had to learn what any pilot in the air has to learn, many things in navigation, in meteorology. This was in ground school. I didn't actually go to formal ground school, but I did study so that I could pass the written examination. After I passed the written examination, I filed with the Federal Aviation Agency for a flight examination. They sent an examiner out to fly with me and test my ability in flying a helicopter. Well, this is it. The day the Federal Aviation Agency examiner came to see whether I could fly a helicopter or not. I had successfully passed the written examination, and the examiner was here looking over my shoulder as I gave the pre-flight. Pre-flight's important, and it is particularly important now. Let's look in there and make sure everything is right. Let off the rotor brake. Check the linkage up there on the swash plate. Linkage okay? He asks you what everything's for every once in a while, and you'd better know. Check those rotor blades. Turn them backwards. That's it check to see if the clutch is free. He looks on with an eagle eye. 
Check the tail rotor now. All this is pre-flight procedure. You do this every time you take off with a helicopter. Today, it's doubly important. Don't let anything pass. Look over everything. Look over everything twice if you have to. Think it's all right? Let's get in and give her a whirl. Fasten the seat belts. Give her a last look. little tension here. Not as calm as I look, actually. Engine going. Check out everything. Tachometer. And there we go. We're off. Into a hover. We cleared with the tower. We're going down to the end of the field and take off for our test. He put me through a rigorous test. We're out for almost an hour and a half as he checked me out in this flight. But we made it. Well, I think most student pilots suffer from uh, inspection-itis or something of that nature. But at any rate, this little card here represents the 40-plus hours that I spent in learning to fly a helicopter. It says that the Federal Aviation Agency feels that I am properly qualified to exercise the privileges of a private pilot in the rotorcraft helicopter rating. Now, there might be a peculiar circumstance there in that I can fly a helicopter and can't fly an airplane, but I plan to take care of that sometime along the way. The point being, we proved our point. Anyone can learn to fly a helicopter. It isn't easy. And perhaps we should add anyone who wants to learn to fly a helicopter can learn. But as you have seen in this film, over a period of some months, I learned. So therefore, the thesis is anyone can fly. Mm -hmm.